All right. Um, hi, Kevin. Hi. Okay. Um, so, um, I, I I just saw you were talking about uh, pack the package. I will, um I'm not. Do you did you install um a MacBook? Um, oh, you, I saw you were saying on Linux, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I just shared that pack the pack package because it um. Mm -hmm. With these libraries, especially, you have some uh, system dependencies you need to install mm -hmm. that are outside of the R like installation. Um, so that package is awesome because you just put in a package what your system is, and it'll give you like a set of command line commands to install those system dependencies. Um, mm -hmm. It's pretty neat. All right. Can I ask a, a question? Yeah. Um, Kevin, I I don't even know why I would need this pack package. Can you explain a little bit? Like, so I tried um, the torch version of the lab exercises. It mm -hmm. seems to be okay. So I'm like, oh, you okay. like, need other system dependencies. It might, it might be that on like Windows. What are you on? Are you on Windows? Windows 10. Yeah. Windows. It might be that on Windows, like there's a different way things get installed. Um, because oh, okay. I know on Linux and I think uh, like like any kind of Linux operating system, I think you need some um, like system libraries that if you don't have it, the installation in R will fail. Um, okay. So so pack just gives you a, basically a list of those dependencies and like what the commands are to install them. Um, okay. It's like, yeah, because I, I was able to install Torch, but like Torch vision i think and another one required like this jpeg and png library that i, I didn't have um so okay okay and it was like it's hard to tell sometimes what through error messages in the package installs like what exactly you don't have because it's like referencing yeah some weird function that it doesn't know where it is or some like object and it's like hard to tell what you need and what you don't have so got it anyway okay yeah. That made sense. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was like trying to install the Torch stuff. And I don't know, maybe there is an issue with um, MacBook M1. I'm not sure anyway, but still I'm struggling to install it. But um, just now open the Slack and uh, say your message, I will try it. Um, so I was struggling to use the Torch stuff um, for the exercise, but um, I was not able to install the um, Torch. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, actually I actually have it. I was going to try I have a M1 also a different computer and I was going to try it there to see mm -hmm. if it worked. Um, so maybe after this, I'll try it and I'll let you know if I'm able to you do it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So I think um, last week we stopped at um, uh, um, we have seen um, um, using CNN, where we saw the architecture for CNN and um, all those stuff, uh, full in stuff. Um, so here they discuss about um, using pre-trained um, networks, class five images. Um, so um, um, when they talk about pre-trained networks, um, what it means is from the name pre-trained, right? So we have neural networks, um, not um, CNN architecture, uh, but a network that has been trained on particular data sets, which is huge data set, um, you know, billions parameters and stuff like that. And now you wanna train your model and you can, you know, exploit the pre-trained language parameters to train your models. So that's what the meaning of class um, pre-trained networks. And so here you can see we use 50 layer ResNet 50. So there are different kinds. So we have an architecture in um, deep plan called ResNet. So we have ResNet 50, we have ResNet 101, I think. So it depends on the layers you have. So ResNet 50 is an architecture with um, 50 layers. We have ResNet 101, I think, um, different kind of architectures. So this ResNet 50 has been trained by people and now it has this 1000 classes um, inside the ImageNet couple. So um, we wanna classify our own images, then we can just use this pre-trained network and you know, 
uh, to train our uh, class well. So the advantage of this using pre-trained networks is um, you don't have access to tons of amount of data, but you have small data, so you can just leverage the idea. This is a central idea of what is called transfer learning. And even if your image or even if your data that has been trained on the pre uh, on the pre-trained network is not the same data on the domain you want to do, it still do um, you know benefit from transfer learning. But the best way uh, is to uh, when we have data set of the, the same domain. So if your image is trained on animal, so you can use a train a pre-trained network to classify something uh, on uh, on animal. But even if the domains are different, they still uh, make sense. So that's about pre-trained networks. Um, so now the next one is um, uh, an example of um, IMDB reviews, um, where we can we'll be able to classify reviews into positive and negative. So this is an example, I think, uh, one of the review, we can see like um, it's just a written text and the review has um, positive and negative classes, which are all, um, I mean, trend and test set. Oh, it's so balanced, um, 25,000 review and each balance with regard to sentiment. Um, so we wanna use a classifier to classify this review, whether review is positive or negative. So one way, which is somehow, um, you know, uh, a classical way of, um, you know, in classical machine learning to work with tests is to create a bag of words. So a bag of words is basically, uh, so the first thing is um, when we have a text, so for example, we have this kind of text, I mean, 1,000, 50,000 of text. So the first thing is we need to, you know, create a bag of word uh, where we take maybe the top 10 or top N most frequently occurred words. So here, if we have this kind of um, review, um, 50,000, so we just binarize them or create like bag of words each and, you know, frequency and take like, the top 10,000 mostly occurring word. This is just um, random, you can, you know, and create what is called, um, you know, one hot encoder and stuff like that. So I think I have some, some, yes, yeah, so something like this. Yeah, so um, for example, here we can see like, um, okay, um, I wanna show this example, oh. Okay, so you can see like here we have something like cut the quick brown for jump over whatsoever. So we can see here what we create is like for each. Now let's assume here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, right? And we have something here. So all these one are words from our text. So we need to create what is called one hot encoder or bag of words. So here we have cat. And uh, here we have zero, here we have one, here we have, so wherever we have, um, you know, the that particular word in our dictionary, we map it to one. So this is some kind of uh, one hot encoding representation. Um, but as you can see, like this representation of word is somehow kind of sparse. So if we have N documents, so here we have 10,000, so we're gonna have like N by P, and the number of, uh, you know, uh, terms, unique word we have. And this, uh, you know, it's gonna be a somehow kind of sparse matrix, right? So if you look at this example that I just showed, uh, this one, so you can see this is a sparse matrix, it's somehow sparse, right? And um, uh, that's how you create bag of word. So this is one of the, you know, first step to work with text is to create bag of word. And I believe we have seen some stuff like that. So the next thing is they will compare logistic regression with um, you know, uh, a two hidden layer neural network and to see their performance. Um, so the bag of word can also be unigram or you know, n-gram, the generation of you know, this stuff. So a unigram is just combination of a single word. A bigram is combination of multiple and you can generalize. 
Um, now the train uh, network, and we can see um, the lasso and you know I am um, the neural nets. Um, we can see um, the have somehow. Okay, so this is the training, right? Um, this is test. This is validation. Okay. Um, what about this? Uh, okay, I think they all do a good job, right? Um, yeah. So even the lasso, um, which is somehow uh not kind of complex, um, you know, like neural net, um, it performs really well. Um, uh. Uh, one of the reasons why I think uh, I'm not, I don't know why, uh, and it's very effective because it can express parsity in X material. So um, I'm not sure what this means. So this um, algorithm, GLMNet, is it good when you're, you have sparse data or whatsoever? Um, I don't know what this point, anyone can jump here. But it's not the data that's sparse. It's just the, this one hot encoding leads to this super oh, yeah. sparse yeah. transition ma or, uh, coefficient mm -hmm. matrix. And GLM that must have some, uh, I mean, there's linear algebra methods for optimizing problems with sparse matrices that GLM that I assume uses. But other than that, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, yeah, um, we can see like, um, you know, um, here training after epoch. So, um, in deep learning, we have something called epoch. So epoch is the, um, all right, so how can I say it? So um, in deep learning, um, we train a model. Oh, so we divide um, <laughs> um, epochs. So who can help me see what exactly is epoch? <laughs> um, so, if we want to train a net um neural networks, what we do is we basically um you know do training in batches, not the whole data set, right? Now, if we train the whole batch we create in one go, like we train this batch, send this batch. When we finish finish training all this batch, that is one epoch, but we, because we are minimizing the error at the first epoch, the error may be large. So we go back to another training epoch. So the more epochs in some sense, the more error goes down. So a, comp a one complete cycle of training and networks is called an epoch. I think that's, I think I may right, I may be right, right? Epoch. That sounds correct to me. I think it's uh, all the way through the whole data set. So multiple, if you do an SGD, it's going to be multiple iterations, but uh -huh. I think. Okay, an epoch is a term used in machine learning to indicate the number of passes of the entire training data set. Yep, that has a usually good in budget. Yeah, so I think I'm right, it's close, <laughs> close to right. So yeah, so that's um, what epoch. So um, different from traditional machine learning, right? In traditional machine learning or classical machine learning, like where we have just GLM, I think we have only one pass, right? We just train our model. Let's, if we have some kind of, but I mean, you know, uh, what do you call it? Uh, split um, cross validation and stuff like that. But we have the notion of epoch, um, if I'm wrong. So, yeah, so we can see in summary, um, this um, uh, really works well. Um, yeah. So, um so we have seen um two different kind of uh, neural networks the first one we have seen cnn um which basically uses um you know centrally for image but now cnn is being used also for text now we have seen also pre-trained networks um which is basically um you know you just take a, a model train in somewhere else um, now the next one is recurrent neural network or somehow uh, sometimes called RNN. So this is um, you know a network that is basically used to uh, you know uh, model sequence. So for example, when I'm spe speaking right now, you can see like I'm speaking in somehow sequence of word, right? And this sequence of word, they don't have uh, the order matters, right? Because um, I cannot speak, you know, in 
you know, something that you guys, you cannot understand. So I need to put these words in order, right? So the order matters. So it is in one direction. It, the sequence is going in the one direction. So that's, um, you know, um, uh, RNN. So it's also used for time series because it's sequence, uh, you know, speech, handwritten, all this one. Um, <clears throat> I use so I use RN build model that take into account sequential nature of the data and build memory of the past. So what this means is that um, RNN basically um, you know has a memory, um, or like um, CNN we have seen CNN doesn't have what is called a memory because CNN um, RNN use what is called the um, knowledge of the past. So yeah, so here there is um, um, an example here you can see. Um, we have RNN here. Uh, we have our X here, the input, and uh, it goes to our neuron over say by the architecture. And now it goes somewhere here. So you can see here, we do have, you know, any somehow an input X, T, or minus one, new input goes into this. But at the same time, the it takes here, there is memory. It, uses the input from the previous stage. So this one also use the input, new input, and also um, the, the previous stage. So this is why uh, you can see that RNN has a memory in some sense. Uh, yeah, so we can see this. Um, we can see like X1, X0, right? Um, X1, X2, but we have an input, and now we have the previous. So it keeps track of what is happening, because like in language, you see, um, to make sense of what I'm saying, you need to consider the previous, what I said, right? Because it's a sequence. You cannot only have this input you, you, without understanding. So the, the memory here helps to understand, to decode, you know, try to, you know, to decode and make CS more understandable or more uh, contextually understandable. So this is, um, you know, um, why they said um, uh, it has the memory of the past. Um, yeah, so you can see this is what they are talking about. Um, yeah, so this is somehow the uh, structure of the, you know, um, the and of the CNN, um, RNN, and it has the same weight. We use the same weight um, for CNN, uh, for RNN. Um, yeah, so um, anyone want to add something? <laughs> right so right, just right. to clarify the rnn though it's like the thing on the left is what you actually do and the thing on the right is what it's equivalent to is that what i'm understanding is you that you what? don't actually have uh, i guess what i'm trying to say is that the diagram on the left of the equals there right where there's just a single uh layer al right that's what is actually you, it's done it's done iteratively right it's not like you actually have a whole bunch of nodes all laid out unfolded like that in the calculation right yeah 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 that's what i can't remember now oh you mean um when we want to um when we want to maybe I don't think even it's only one not this representation yeah is that right hmm I, I cannot even yeah i'm not sure because in that representation you would have a like a node for every point right <laughs> in the no um i guess each of those, each of those a1s is not even just a node right i mean i guess it depends what x1 is yeah i think yeah I thought, yeah i thought x1 to x2 x3 would be like the points in a sequence or observation in a sequence like so like Time one, time two, time three. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, gotcha. Yeah. So I think um maybe this representation it just you know um expanded. We just expanded here. We can see this is a notion that they are talking about the memory. So the output is all a feedback here, and we can see like there's some weight everywhere. You can see the same weight, and this is just the output here. We have different output. Yeah. Okay, so um, RNN in detail. So this is the math. This is a bit mathy. 
<laughs> so we can see here um they are doing some kind of you know the weight stuff and you know the summation um you know in each node and also the previous one because here we we need to have for example um we need to add the previous one and the current one and also the weight so this is what they are saying and finally we can see um uh we sum this with b node i don't know what this b um maybe i don't know what this b is it intercept or something like that? uh Anybody knows what this B is? I think that's the output, right? Because it, it, I don't know if this is the proper term, but in the output layer, then it just becomes like a, almost like a linear regression, right? With like, you know, intercept coefficient and then um, yeah. it's linear yeah. in the terms. Yeah, but I was thinking like we do have weight. Um, this is a weight, but what would be this output they are adding to as well? It's, it's, yeah, it's the output oh, layer weights. It's just ah, the output layer oh, weights. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so so because we are passing to um, each one to another one, so yeah, the output layers, they also have weight, right? This is the weight we initialize. So do you mean this is the weight we learn? Because um, this weight- You learn start. both, W and B. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you as well. <laughs> mm. All right. Okay. So um, what they're trying to do now, I think, um, is to you know um, reduce the RNN, um, the IMDB review problem with this um, uh, RNN. So as we already said, um, we're gonna use. Uh, Okay, the document feature is a sequence of word. We typically truncate part document on the same number of L word. So here, what they are saying is, um, um, in deep learning, we you do what is called padding. So um, we define a sequence a sequence where all our text will be that length. If a sequence, so for example, here I have um, a sequence. Um, I love this cart, or I love this car, and I have another sequence which is long. So when you train a deep learning uh, neural network with different sequence lanes, it does not work well. So the idea is basically to pad all your uh, 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 all your text before training the model. That is, um, or you truncate. If it is typically larger, larger, then you truncate. If it is lower than the specified threshold um, lanes, then you pad them. So there are some kind of padding, or you put zero, 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 or something like that, just to pad it. Um, yeah, so here, this is something that we talk about of, on how to encoding. Um, yeah, so the previous one, um, uh, we, we saw we use one how to encode them, but this is an extremely smart feature and will not work well um, with um, RNN. So I'm not sure, you can see here in previous case, we saw that, um, uh, you know, the uh, GLM net works well with this past presentation. But I think uh, in deep learning or neural network, it may not work well, as I said. Uh, so instead of this, they use um, you know, a word embedding matrix, um, uh, which basically um, you know, is not uh, that kind of you know, sparse uh, representation. So this is word embedding. So like this is one hot, right? So we can see this is one hot. Um, in one hot, for example, we have this word, this. So this is where this occur only. We put one or everywhere, every other place is zero. Is occur in maybe our sentence here. Every other place is zero. This is, you know, one hot encoding and it's passed. But the an embedding, uh, so this is a sentence we are working on. This is one of the best film actually some whatsoever. So you can see this because um, this is where we have the, this is, is represented here, everyone. So the idea, because the reason why here you see like um, um, it's not um, uh, in C, uh, we, we, it, this one does not start with zero. Uh, I think the way it, it is arranged. <clears throat> so um, you can see here the embeddings um, has everywhere has representation, right? It's not only one in what, one what, we have only one, only one, all other place. But here we all have figures. 
Um, so what this means is that, uh, so I have something in here. Yeah, so this is an example of embedding. So for example, here you can see like I have word, uh, words like man, woman, king, queen. So for us to represent any word, it, ha it, it is represented using like um, uh, sequence continuous values. Uh, yeah, so you can see we have woman, you know, this, it, 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 we just represent any word with vector of sequence of values, something, something like that. So we can see we have woman, king, you know, everyone. So this is called the word embedding. And uh, if we, yeah. So if there is this blog, I like this blog um, by JJ Illustrated Waterbeck by J. Alama. Um, he explained really well on Waterbeck and he has a very good example of what um, um, embedding is. If you look at this is the embedding of king, man, woman, right? And if you look at them, these, you know, they looks like the same, you know, we have the same here, um, all the figure, all the values here, because we can see these are values, right? These are values, zero point, these, so all the values now are represented with, you know, some colors so that we can understand this. So you can see like the embedding of king looks similar to this, to the man, uh, to the man, right? Um, this is the woman. So putting all the embeddings here, you can see that. Um, yeah, so you can see that is some kind of a scenario. So here um, they do some like some kind of king minus man plus woman give you a queen. So you can see the embedding for the queen, um, you know, when we do these subtractions. So, um, you know, look at this queen and king. You can see like the king and queen, you can see they have some kind of um, similar representation and stuff like that. So this is, um, you know, a better representation. Um, uh, than using word embedding because this is not sparse and it embed what is called contextual informations um, in some sense is yeah we have what is called contextual embedding um, you with this you can find um, synonyms of what something there is a relationship between this but in this one there is no relationship encoded with this representation but in this representation there is somehow kind of a you know encoded representation because king we can see like is somehow close to man, and we can see like woman may be close to uh, queen be, uh, due to uh, their uh, uh, vector of values. Yeah, so that's, um, um, you know, so embedding, so how do you find embedding? So this embedding also are pre-trained, meaning they are, we train a neural network to get them um, just as we saw. So you can just download the embeddings, free train and just, you know, um, use them. Uh, yeah, so there are different implementation, what to bear, globe, uh, the two popular uh, embedding strategies that one can use to get the embedding. So after getting the embedding, what do we need to do? It's just to train the model with the embedding, similar to the previous way, but in this way, in this approach, not using one hot, but using embedding. So they train the embedding with a disappointing result, uh, 76 accuracy. Um, uh, so RNN has, you know, um, many variants. Um, one is called LSTM. There, there is another one called GRU, Gator Re 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 Recurrent Neural Network. LSTM called Long Shot Term, you know. Um, so what is happening is, um, you know, okay. Um, if we can look at this LSTM versus G uh, RNN versus GRU. So these are the structures for different. So this is the vanilla RNN structure. This is LSTM. This is GRU. They are all based on RNN. Um, but the central idea here, I think uh, I don't have this on top of my head right now. The central idea for um, you know LSTM is that RNN. What is happening is um, in the structure of RNN here. Um, when because we said it has memory, right? So if I'm talking um, the context that is spoken here, when it the sequence is large, it forget it. The, it, the RNN, the vanilla RNN, forget the sequence. So just imagine when I'm talking, I'm talking and talking. When I speak long, it is difficult in some sense to make sense of the previous word I said. So this struggle 
to do that. So this is one of the disadvantages of um, you know, this um, vanilla RNN. So the LSTM, which is long short term, so it means it can you know take longer. Well, yeah, so it can basically forget. You can see they add something called forget gates and stuff like that. So input whatsoever. Um, so this is uh, you know uh, yeah. So even the uh, GRU is also uh, on the same idea, I guess. Anyway, just scratching the top. But um, um, anyone, if you can, you know. Give, yeah, so you can see like uh, moving, um, you know, uh, using now the LSTM, um, uh, we have, um, you know, um, a better performance, um, slightly less than the GLM, which is 88%, right? Um, so, okay, so the best, um, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, result found on this data set uh, is 95 percent okay so what they mean here is that um, this data has been used maybe for you know um competition i don't know the lady they are talking about the ledger board i don't know but uh, uh several people train um uh, on different architecture for rnn with this data and the performance based performance uh is 95 percent um yeah anyone want to add something Right, so um, so we saw that um, RNN is basically good, and you can see like it can achieve a good performance of ninety five percent accuracy, um, more than the so yeah, deep learning um shines in this sense, right? Um, so um, this is another you know example they work on time series. Um, I just keep this time series. Uh, let's go on. Um, I didn't read this time series, and um, if anyone wants to add anything on that, yeah. So um, this is just like the summary of um, of RNN and trying to move to another stuff. Um, they said that um, you know the baseline or the you know the baseline of RNN vanilla <clears throat> may maybe sample and may not achieve a competitive performance, but um, the complex versions or variation exists, and they can you know give a competitive performance yeah um yeah so <clears throat> yeah so um they talk about here seek to seek uh, which is used to deep learning uh, translation okay so when to use deep learning so we saw that uh, now that uh, actually deep learning uh you know achieve um, a good performance right a competitive result but we have already seen that G glm Nate um, has a good performance as well. Um, so when to use which? Um, <clears throat> so um, they just conclude with saying, using outcomes appraisal principle. Um, a simpler model always works. Um, it's always data because it's more interpretable. Uh, meaning that, um, for example, at this point, we can see that GLM Nate um, achieved like 80, uh, 87 using um, LSTM and uh, 88 using, no, it is, it, um, yeah, it is eight, 87 using LSTM and 89 using G, um, GLMnet. Um, you can see the difference is not that, you know, huge, right? So the idea is like, if the solution is simple and, you know, the difference is not that, you know, huge, just choose solutions that are more interpretable. But in this today, um, in the world of deep learning, um, I think this is not uh, quite apply, uh, applicable because if you want to see like performance, you know, you want to, if you are doing, um, you know, um, machine learning or deep learning, this is uh, the state of the art, uh, deep learning transformers. Um, yeah, so people don't care more. I think on this concept of interpretable, people just doing, uh, going, crazy with this large, huge language model because of, uh, you know, state of the art performance they give. Um, yeah, and also they talk about here that um, if you have a very good data set, um, you know, you can train, you know, classical machine learning model, you know, to perform really, really well, comp um, you know, uh, you know uh, in comparison to uh, deep neural network. Okay, um, yeah, anyone wants to add something? On this, hmm. 
Hmm. Okay. Right. And I think you covered things really well uh, on all that, especially the when to use it. I think. I mean, that's kind of the main. I mean, this is a lot. This is a deep chapter, so to speak. And for me, at least, I found that. Hold on one second. At least I found that there was uh, um, it, like a, a lot of topics covered. And like you said, just scratching the surface of all of these. So to me, this is like, hey, <laughs> all I got really got out of this chapter is there's these, you know, here's how the neural networks basically work. Here's the, some libraries are out there. Here's some of the ways you can use them in, in, in more advanced ways with RNNs and things like that. But um, I think one important takeaway, though, is that, yeah, you don't always just reach for this new shiny toy. Um, sometimes you're better off with your well used uh, re logistic regressions and other type of things where you can perhaps better understand too what the what the results mean, right? Mm -hmm. Does that make any sense? That's what I, that's kind of what I got out of it. I don't know. Yeah. Jerry, yeah. Do you have any insight on that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I I can't say like I have too many projects where I would like reach for it. Like, I don't know. I I think most of what I need to do majority of the time I have like a bigger need for interpretability and kind of understanding of like predictions and feature importances and things like that. And I think deep learning, like I'm not, I'm not trying to like, just, you know, make a model and, you know, let it, let it run and, yeah. you know, optimize for like some crazy good performance. Like, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm not like, like, I, I think I, like if you're building a product where people are using something that relies on like accuracy of, mm -hmm. of this underlying model, whether it's like speech. So like my company does a lot with it because the underlying product that I'm supporting is speech recognition, right? Mm -hmm. So, so for so for that, it's incredible. Um, but in that case, you don't care which features are going to be influencing, you know, the mm -hmm. prediction for what word is being spoken. Yeah, you just want people to to have an accurate, you know. <laughs> speech yeah. text and um and for that it's 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 a state of the art um so it just makes sense to use it there but yeah i don't know I, I think you need kind of a combination of a lot of data like a long run for like a project a long time frame to like really set something up that that's like the right architecture that works well i don't i don't know i i'm still trying to find a use case i guess in a lot of ways um and and I have seen a lot of people talk on Twitter lately about um, like tabular data, you know, data sets that are traditional machine learning data sets where you have like each row is a distinct observation with a bunch of different features. Um, and you want to, you know, do a classification or regression problem like in that kind of thing where it's not image, it's not language, you know, sequence, sequential data, it's just independent observations. Like something like XG Boost often outperforms <laughs> yep. neural nets. So yep. and I I I'm I'd be much like I love using like I've used XG Boost at work and like that's a lot quicker for me to like set up and train and find the right hyperparameters. Like that that whole thing is a lot more straightforward mm -hmm. to me, but maybe I just need more experience with deep learning. I don't know. Um yeah, I, I also see such kind of, you know, thread in uh, Twitter, like people that say SG boost is all you need, <laughs> you know, um, also in Kaggle, um, um, mm -hmm. one of the top, you know, com what win competitions, um, I was reading the Kaggle, Kaggle book, uh, all these, you know, ensemble, you know, approaches like um, SG boost and other stuff. Um, yeah, so LG boost, um, typically in some sense, as like this kind of data that you mentioned, um, I mean, this is a way to go. Um, yeah. Sorry, yeah. what's SG boost? Just like same a, question. <laughs> it's just uh, in, in the boosted, like remember in the chapter we did boosted trees? Um, yes. It's just a algorithm for gradient boosting um, that you can use with like decision trees that are like random forest type of setup but it's like it's um i think it's the idea is like you're if i remember correctly from that chapter is you're like training you're training on the residuals right so like you're mm -hmm. predicting from a set of nodes like different observations and then you're then you're taking whatever the leftover is and, and fitting a new tree tree on that mm -hmm. um and I think XG Boost is like way to do that optimally, like a 
Uh, I'm not 100% sure what, uh, yeah, what that part of it is. I think, I think it's, I think it's just a way to find like the optimal splits and um, thresholds and things like that. But uh, mm -hmm. I could be totally wrong, but you know, it's, it's something of that nature um, with and normally applied to like a boosted, yeah, tree boosting type of, type of thing. Right, right. Oh, okay, okay. That's actually helpful. I think, um, Tim, yeah, thanks so much for going over in detail, like, especially like the encodings, because I was like, I don't even understand what that embedding is and how it was. I mean, I got that it was different from one hot encoding, but it's nice to see how, you know, it's actually um, whatever those weights, and then you um, do a dimensionality reduction for, I guess, you know, similarities or something. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. I guess the other thing, um, and going over a little bit of the lab, they did say, for example, like, um, I, I do agree that, you know, you probably should be um, using these when they're appropriate to use and simpler things that are more interpretable, like Kevin said, um, in other scenarios. Um, they did say, uh, for example, that you know how you can run multi-class logistic regression and you can use that GLM net. Um, but they say that, for example, that is very slow on very large data sets. And in that case, you can just um, you know, fit a, a neural network and just have an input and output layer omitting the hidden layers. And then that's a way to you know, do this multi-class logistic regression in, in a way that's faster. So I thought, okay, that's like a useful tip, you know, like if mm -hmm. for whatever reason your, your thing is taking forever with a normal GLM net, um, that's a, a cool tip. And um, can I show you guys something? So I went last week, I attended this virtual, uh, it's like yeah. a short course called um, Machine Learning Methods for Quantification. It's like automatic quantification of behavior. Want to share that screen? Yeah, let me share screen. I cannot share screen. Well, Sham is sharing screen. Okay. Let me see. Uh, sorry. Hold on. Here we go. Okay. Can you see this? Yeah. Yes. Yep. Screen? Okay. So this is. Um, software called Deep Lab Cut. And it's actually put out by, um, it's one of these like uh, labs that are building computational tools for this kind of analysis. And the really cool thing is, is that this is markerless, you know, behavior tracking. So that for example, um, I don't know how, how familiar you guys are, but a lot of behavioral assays, like for example, right? If you're looking at say aging and or frailty in mouse models, Oftentimes the behavior um, is scored, you, you know, like quantified by a human manually, or at least it used to be. And that takes so much time. Like, I, I think I've had my fill of that. I'm like, I'm never scoring behavior by hand ever again. <laughs> That's probably just gonna come and bite me um, at some point. But this um, type of, you know, like computational model actually uses like a pre-trained, um, I think it's a ResNet 50, also trained an image net, right? And then because it knows how to recognize features of images, then um, just with training on a few labels on sometimes, you know, a few species, like you have mouse flies, and then this is like a, a rat reaching, you know, like a, a lever task. Um, it can learn um, how, to, how to do this. And essentially what it does is, for each pixel that it's analyzing, uh, what I understood is that it calculates the probability of a specific joint being in a specific pixel. And then it can sort of like, you know, from frame to frame, tell you where the joint is and how it's moving and therefore like track the, the motions of the animal. And so I thought like this was super, super cool. So um, these are some other examples, right? So this is like a rat walking on a wheel and it's tracking like position of the legs and then the tails. There's a horse and then they trained it on, you know, two, uh, just a few examples of horses. And it was able to track, you know, race horses on, on tracks even when it was at a different angle, right? So I think they also do that um, data augmentation, right? Where they actually feed it different angles or um, sort of distorted or sheared images so that it can um, learn to 
position properly in those. And then like, for example, this is, you know, a, a rat grabbing a pellet. This is a uh, rat whiskers, which is usually done for a somatosensory cortex in rats and then human. And this is like pupillometry. Um, okay, so this is one of the tools that's being used. And then the next one, uh, they also had a presentation, is this leap algorithm. So it's very similar to these this uh, deep lab cut. So also using like a convolutional neural network. The really cool thing about this is that um, they design sort of lightweight uh, neural networks, meaning so it's very task specific. So it's probably, you know, already trained on like a specific either animal during a specific task. And um, then you don't need a lot of layers and a lot of like computational time to do this. And the great thing about this is that I think, for example, in this particular paper where they're, it's almost like a proof of concept, they're looking at uh, male fly courting behaviors. And so um, they're able to track, you know, the position, the exact behavior the male is doing, whether it's doing its, you know, mating, singing thing or whatnot. And the network can actually, you know, detect the position I think it took like three and a half milliseconds to do that, right? And the awesome thing about that is that then you can, if you can detect behavior that quickly, then you can control behavior in the female via other like optogenetics or what other things, right? So I, I was just blown away by this because yeah, fitting, you know, like a lightweight CNN for real time, like behavior probability, like scoring, and then using other tools like optogenetics and that sort of thing, you can actually modify the female's response to the male, right? And so I was like, wow, okay, this is, you know, like next sort of like generation stuff. So this one's called um, Sleep, uh, Deep Learning System for Multi-Animal Pose Tracking and similar things. So this is from the lab of Malamurthy and the guy that developed it is called Talmo Pereira. Um, Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing. And uh, yeah, that was my exciting thing last week because since we had gone over a bit of the theory behind this, I was like, oh, I think I'm understanding. So mm -hmm. it was really great to, <laughs> yeah, to, you know, sit there and somewhat understand at least what was going on with the CNNs and things. Yeah. Really cool. Did you, are you gonna use that like software at all for something you, you I do? I hope or? so. So eventually if I'm still, you know, working on behavior, which, um, I probably will because I, I have a lot of interest in either like, you know, stress and anxiety research um, or social interactions. Um, and so it seems like now though, like there, it's, it's not like you need to even code these things. They're making them available as GUIs where you, you know, you have your experiment, you have to have, you know, certain FPS on the cameras and everything. And then I think, through the GUI for either one of those systems, you can just, you know, label, I don't know, maybe a few images, and then the system should be able to learn it for you. Um, but it's just really cool in terms of like what some of these things can do because, so for example, like if you just don't give it labels, right? And just leave it completely unsupervised, it might find structure and behaviors that humans might not have noticed. You know what I mean? So we're very used to like, for example, if you have, say that you're tracking mice, right? And it's like some kind of social interaction between mice, which is very, very common in, for example, like autism studies. And so um, they'll do, you know, like anal genital sniffing or how many times the mouse approached, like what distance, um, all these metrics, right? But I think that in applying maybe some of these unsupervised like neural networks, they could pick up on extra things that we as humans just did not pick up on. And so it might be interesting um, to see later on in the future, like if they come up with some new thing, right? Um, in, for example, like the expression of like autistic behaviors that is not something that a human would have noticed. Or, you know, in a sense, like what other structures in, in the behavior is there that the neural networks could pick up on? Um, yeah, but for me, I, I hope so. I, I hope to be able to, you know, apply some of these um, pretty much because they're cool. And also because I never want to score behavior by hand again. So <laughs> that is hours and hours and hours of video. And I'm like, I'm not getting, you know, those hours of my life back. 
but that, that's just how it was sort of in the past yeah yeah it's, it's really neat I actually um it's funny you mentioned the pose thing because I a while ago I had this like project idea I wanted to make a um, Bye, um I had uh no, I think he was just saying he was going to read up on it. Yeah, I'm not leaving. I'm just saying oh, thanks for, I see. Okay, okay. Thanks, <laughs> thanks for the additional homework. <laughs> uh, yeah. More books for you, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, but uh, what I was going to say is I had a project idea a while ago to like make a like a app that um, uh, it would be more than a project. It's like a company, but and I think there are apps that exist to do this. But for tennis, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. like there are all these. Uh, these uh like fancy systems with like a bunch of cameras where you um can use it to like track balls and like i don't know if you're familiar with the recent tennis technology but players can now like challenge calls and things like that based on oh, where right. the ball landed and they know exactly like the moment the point the the point point on the court based on all these cameras mm -hmm. kind mm -hmm. of where it, it it was making contact with the court and if how that um if it touched the line at all um and anyway and like I think uh and back like so I, I grew up playing tennis and uh back um when I was when I was playing when I was little we used to track like statistics on matches manually so we would like hmm. you know say first serve in first serve out like and you would track all these things and the end it would give you a bunch of statistics about like you know how many like and you track even shots like like forehand to forehand backhand volley overhead like all this stuff and i was just thinking that like with a camera on like an iphone and deep learning you could probably mm -hmm. get kind of close to automating a lot of that um right. so anyway so i started looking at like pose stuff because to like track like people on a court um and uh there's like this pose flow library um that uh -huh. does i think what you were showing basically but for human for humans yeah uh -huh. um anyway so just think it's a cool idea and like a really neat uh application um of deep learning um but mm -hmm. the other thing you said that i think i also was saying last week or mentioned that i think is really powerful like this whole idea of like using a pre-trained model and fine-tuning it for your yeah. case yeah. like i'm actually interested in that as like a also like a environmental um conservation like standpoint like mm -hmm. These companies are, you know, like how can we be more efficient with with computational resources in the deep learning area? Like, you know, um, right. and, it, and it also makes me wonder, like, for like a time series problem, can you have a pre-trained LSTM model and use it on a completely different time series data set? But somehow, will mm -hmm. the, you know, will the um, you know the structure that that it has learned on some other time series data set be useful for a different time series but maybe it has similar seasonality or something you know right like i just yeah. i'm curious about like and and also in addition to that for torch in r is it easy mm -hmm. to do that kind of thing you know and do we have act, like are there libraries that allow you to like download some like fancy pre-trained model that was you know maybe maybe it was like reduced a little bit from its like huge size or some light version of it or something but anyway yeah. i'm just curious about that area of like stuff because like i'm not that interested in like building a massive data set you know and doing that myself right right right, but, right, right. Yeah. but if there's cases where i can fine-tune something that has been that where that's been done and like mm -hmm. open source and like you know i can use it for my context that would be super interesting to do um, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm guessing that those are going to become more and more available, right? As people, I guess, hop on to actually performing experiments or, or doing these sorts of things. Um, huh. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Sam, are you showing your screen? Yeah, this is pre-trained deep recurrent neural net for time series classification. That's pretty cool. Okay. Yeah. So I guess, yeah, I guess you could do that. I mean, that was something that Jeremy Howard talks a lot about in his book, but what we were talking about last week, um, mm -hmm. kind of the power of taking some big model and fine tuning it. And then, you know, it usually works pretty well for, um, yeah, for, uh, 
yeah so i guess there's like a there's a market out there for yeah where you can buy it you can spy <laughs> pre-train or sell <laughs> trees or not trees uh, networks that you've trained it's kind of cool right it's, right. it's in other words it's a product right i mean you mm -hmm. put a lot of work to it yeah and produce the thing it's a i've heard i've also heard some really interesting um like conversations about that and like um like so there are a few angles on it like um uh let me just think like so if you have a model like that um like who owns the architecture i guess yeah. um mm -hmm. and like if the data was generated from like a product and like there's also like privacy issues because like can you recover information about individual observations from that model you know and like and like is there like a privacy issue if it's like sensitive data and uh whatever like all these um issues oh, that, I wonder if there's also issues like a, of like ownership and like privacy and stuff with, mm -hmm. with I wonder if there's also a, a, a security vulnerability issue too like if somebody to train a tree but like sneak in some easter eggs so it behaves badly in certain situations oh yeah yeah right and then mm. get the government or somebody you don't like to use it right <laughs> yeah right interesting right. yeah the, write that down. <laughs> the um i'm starting my new company called tree sanitization no not a tree <laughs> but uh, neural net sanitization <laughs> <laughs> yeah but yeah i mean i, I yeah. obviously there's some like proprietary like you know interest in not releasing all these big models but but i think some companies do and like there also are like kind of companies that do have a, a social focus you know um yeah yeah but they have a mission you know about demo, demo, democratizing ai for instance or right you know right. where they are they do release things like that um right, like right. i think like maybe deep mind has something like that i did watch by the way i did watch uh alpha go is right oh, oh you watch it i rewatched it <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome That's awesome it's, it's very good cool. yeah wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, so good. It was funny um, how like confident the uh what's his yeah. name? Yeah. Uh, Sandra she rewatched the Alpha Go again, right? <laughs> I did, yeah. I was telling Sham yesterday, like right after I told Kevin, I'm like, oh, I think I'm too excited. I got to watch it. <laughs> so I did. Oh. Um, but yeah, that uh Issa doll at the beginning, right? Because they were like, there's no way that uh like computer, right, is gonna beat a human at go. Like that's decades away and then slowly it's it, to me it was just amazing how over months right from the time that it beat like the european champion that fan way guy and then it just got stronger and stronger um and it's just so fast at, at doing that 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 brings up a point that i wanted to uh kind of make and that is that's a good example right the the deep learning helped create a go bot that can play go better than the human but the downside is it doesn't really tell us much about how to play Go ourselves, right? So yes, that's, yes. So and some yeah. of the, that's one of the reasons why I don't use these kind of models very often because I I want to know like what can I do differently? <laughs> like how can this is what my model predicts? Like okay, I predict this much customer, you know, retention or whatever. Uh -huh. Okay, great. But how how can I fix this problem? <laughs> I yeah. want to have yeah. more customer retention or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, part of the part of the problem with um like there's great power in making something that's supposed to emulate the structure of the human brain. But then part of the issue with it is you need a whole new field of psychology for, for yeah. <laughs> networks. Mm -hmm. yeah. the neural like, net doctor is in <laughs> yeah. it's like, honestly, like it's just as complex in some ways. Right. I mean, not as right. complex, but like, still like, like it's a, it's a black box, just like the human brain, you know, like, uh, right. Right. like uh, it's, Except the problem is you can't ask it any other questions <laughs> except for yeah. what I was trained on. So, um, you know, that, uh, that's so true. And it can't yeah. introspect, you know. So, mm -hmm. nevertheless, it's it is pretty damn cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because you know, even for um, I I think maybe after watching that AlphaGo, now I'm getting a lot of chess recommendations. But um, so you know those uh, whatever you know algorithms like Stockfish that have that can play, you know, way better than humans. It's sort of like, they've been around for a while, but it's still, you know, like you, you hear people like, you know, Magnus Carlson and, and others say, you know, yeah, but it, so 
either you play like a human, right? So humans are still playing like humans, but Stockfish is playing like itself. And I'm like, so how, I guess sort of what Kevin, what you were saying, right? How similar is it to the human process and do humans actually learn from that or not? Because those have been around now for a while. So you would imagine that maybe top players that grew up in that era, right? Would play more like the computer, but I think it doesn't necessarily mean that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think in the movie with AlphaGo, those mm -hmm. top players mm -hmm. were learning through experience of playing the AlphaGo player, and they were coming up with strategies based on like what they thought would happen and what didn't happen, or some novel mm -hmm. like approach. Um, yeah, so I think they do learn, but it's like through behavior and like exposure, not like through like uh directly you know opening up the model yeah. Open up, yeah 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 i guess that's true yeah that's i think that's that's also going to be an interesting question you know just uh overall like how similar is it because um one of the presentations uh the one of the keynotes um uh, she's uh so i think she's a janelia but started at caltech so machine vision person right and been developing a lot of these like uh CNNs for like image classification and then behavior classification. And so part of the, the idea there is the, the, it's, and it's kind of compelling, you know, and, and something nice to think about that if you understand the model, right, then you understand the behavior. And so the behavior just becomes sort of like you can squash it down into understanding of the of the model and how that works but i think that that's sort of provided that it actually works right so you could have the same output but the process being totally different right in, in the way that you arrive to it and so it doesn't necessarily mean that the behavior as output you know by um, animal brain or human brain is the same and so i guess they they also have to develop things as to how to check, right? How, how can you check that it is the same underlying process that you're, that is giving you the same result? Um, so maybe, you know, that'll open a whole new field, like you're saying of like, a, what is it like a neural net psychology or behavioral analysis? One, yeah, but on that topic though, of like interpret, mm -hmm. interpretability, um, like I know for something like, you know, XG boost or decision trees, like there's, mm -hmm. there's like, uh, libraries and approaches like Shapley values to basically uh -huh. like uh, iteratively like um, adjust different features and see kind of mm -hmm. what its impact is on the output and like quantify the importance of each feature based on like how it changes predictions, I guess. Um, right. And right. Um, I'm just curious, like, I bet there are attempt, efforts like that, but I don't think they really covered them much in the chapter, like around mm -hmm. interpretability. Um, but like, I think it says there are methods. It's not as black boxy as we're saying right, right. now, but, right, right. but uh, they definitely didn't, you know, really get into that at all. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a surprise, I guess, from a coverage standpoint. Right, um, yeah, that is true. Okay. Although I prefer things like, uh, you know, oh, wow. sorry, Sam, you were saying. Yeah, so I said, um, so I need to walk off now to go for another stuff. So, <laughs> okay. yeah, um, thank you all for maybe we see next week for the next chapter, right? Are we doing lab next week for this chapter? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, <laughs> the chapter like takes three weeks. Maybe we shall. I didn't even, you know, was not able to go through it because I was not able to do the installation. Um, but I believe you have gone oh, through right. it, right? Yeah. So the, on the original schedule, we have the next chapter next week, like okay. the content. Yeah. Um, and we did do two weeks on this. I, I, um, I don't know. Personally, I'd be okay with moving on to the next yeah, one. Yeah. Um, let's move on. So if there is anyone with, you know, some, you know, issue, then we can discuss. But yeah, let's move on because like we have two weeks for the chapter and uh, yeah okay that yeah. sounds good so is it okay if i ask questions then next week oh yeah, yeah. questions yeah. on the lab so yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah i think i think you know i and also in the chat too um i think mm -hmm. true still, still a good place i i want to i do want to look at it a little more um mm -hmm. you know throughout the week but uh just like look at some of the interpretability options and things like that um and right loading in pre-trained 
models and all those things. So, um, but, but yeah, I just, uh, I don't know. I'm afraid of yeah. like spending three weeks on a. Um, yeah, no, no good at it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the next okay. one's really interesting too. I think, uh, let me remind myself what it is. Um, I think it might be survival. Analysis. Yeah, survival analysis. Yeah. That one, I like when I saw the book, I was like, this is, that's going to be one I really want to learn more about and sensor data. Yeah. Oh, that's you, Ron. All right. Yeah, it's me. Sure. I'm, I have not yet looked at it, but I will do it. We still, have the, <laughs> we still have the right, the right dates there. Yeah. Yep, we do. Um, cool. Uh, sorry. Right, so you're still on, still good for yes. that. All right. Yeah, awesome. Yep. Cool. Yeah. I've next, I have this next week off. So I have lots of time to read. Um, Although oh, nice. other things to do, but yeah, I will spend spend a decent amount of time on it. Um, yeah, always and video games. <laughs> I think it'd be interesting if you all like think about other deep learning applications or or ways that you would like start using it. Um, I just find like that that part of it's hard for me, like finding use cases. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I sort of fell into a one that was already tailor made that someone else had thought about that I can use, you know, like yeah. this uh, quantification of behavior. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, that's really cool. Um, yeah, so I don't know. Uh, it's, uh, I, I didn't also, one thing I didn't see really was it seems like, like um, on my computer, uh, the torch stuff I, that I got going was pretty quick. Um, like mm -hmm. I know that in the chapter, in the resources they had mentioned, they have two versions of this exercises because of um, there was some speed issues with Torch, but John was saying that they were working on those, and oh. I, it, did, it did seem pretty pretty decent. Although I like didn't really have anything to benchmark it against, but it, like you know, in less than a minute for most of the model training. <laughs> okay, so I did the Torch one. One right. of them took two minutes the other took 22 minutes oh really okay yeah. maybe i didn't get to that one because i didn't go through every exercise I, oh, okay. I think i got up to like the handwriting one or like the mincy mincy one uh, right 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 which one do you remember like, what that was oh my gosh uh, let me see um forget which one it yeah is. 20, I, I definitely didn't wait for 20 minutes on, on what i did yeah and I was like, okay, so you know how they say like it, it ran for them in two minutes with a Mac, yeah, yeah. whatever, four cores and then like 16 RAM. I yeah. think that's what my machine has, or maybe I haven't configured it properly, but yeah, it took 22 minutes. I was just, just sitting there waiting. So oh, I, I can't, uh, where is it? It might've been, hold on. This one. What towards the end before the IMDb? Um, maybe the CFAR one? It might have been that CFAR example. So it's a different data set of images. Oh, okay. I may, maybe I didn't get that sound. Um, okay. Doesn't sound familiar. Uh, you said C C far. C far. So it's um. Let me see. Uh, convolutional neural networks. Um, for mine, it's around line four seventy. Um. Four seventy. I think it was this one. Um, okay, I have like IMBD stuff there. Okay. Maybe did you download the the? Torch? Yeah, yeah, that's the one. Yeah, At total time twenty two minutes fifty eight point three seconds. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Huh. You said four seventy was your line. Uh yeah four seventy so. The section that starts. Uh, convolutional neural networks. So it says, you know, in this section, we fit a CNN to the CIFAR data, C-I-F-A-R, mm -hmm. which is available in the Torch Vision package. 
yeah for me it's in the in the markdown file around line oh i see it now it's yeah. okay so in, oh i didn't download a markdown i just have an r script uh so oh okay i'm 265 i see okay um mm -hmm. yeah let me see so is that what they're talking about with the a torch maybe okay yeah. um I mean, I know that, yeah, John said they were working on it. Okay, yeah, I don't think I did, I got to this one or I skipped it or something. Right. Um, okay, right. bye, Ron. Me, I'm going to start it now and see what happens. Um, okay. I see, so you just did this uh, first fit, right? Uh, mm -hmm. That's what you're talking about. Okay. Okay, so I fit it and then whatever else. So, so the actual running the model, right? Um, and then evaluate, I think it was that last step. All right, mine is cooking. I'll let you know how long it takes. I'm just curious. Mm, yeah, I I'd be curious too. My computer is is louder for sure. Mm -hmm. All right. Um. Yeah. So I guess we'll yeah we can go to the that next um. That sounds good. Um, okay. I don't want to keep you, Kevin. Um. I'm excited that you did watch the AlphaGo thing. I've been so yeah, <laughs> excited I, about the documentary for a long time now. So and that's why I was thinking about DeepMind. Like I was, it, it does seem like they're. I know they're affiliated with Google, I think, or they were started by Google or something. But no, I think they were bought by Google. Oh, they're bought by Google. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But they do seem to have some kind of a pro-social bend to what they're doing. I think so, because I mean, I, I hope that that is the case, um, because you know how they also um, had that alpha fold. So that was a huge breakthrough as well. So you know how um, that alpha fold program can determine the structure, the 3D structure of like every protein. Right. And that has always been like a, a challenge in biology, because like you should be able to determine the 3D like folding structure, right, of a protein from the sequence of amino acids, but that's always been very difficult. And so they solved that, you know, and now it's it's available. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, I'm not, you know, working on proteins or protein structures, but I had heard, you know, that that was always a thing in predicting those because as, as always, you know, the structure will then sort of inform function. And so that that's why you want to want to mm -hmm. know it. Um, and then the other thing is they just came up with a paper. I think it was sometime either earlier this year where they applied their um, I think it's alpha zero sort of like architecture or whatever, you know, network to solving faster matrix multiplication. And so I was like, oh, OK, so, you know, how important is that? But then I thought, you know, well, for example, in this thing with predicting like behavior real time, right? If you can shave off milliseconds. So even if, if they're, I, I don't know if this is the case, right? But their new way of solving this matrix multiplication, which makes it faster, can do that, then it can help in those types of applications. Like not so much, you know, if I'm just running it on my computer and it doesn't matter to me if it, you know, takes a minute longer or not. But real time behavior, it's, it's sort of like, yeah, you know, your window opportunity has passed <laughs> if if you're, you know, like neural network or program or whatever is taking too long in predicting. So I'm like, oh, okay, you know, that that sounds like a like a cool thing that could actually be very relevant in in some real time application like that. Mm -hmm. Not that you know, matrix multiplication is terribly exciting because I'm like. <laughs> but maybe application wise it, it turns out that you know that it might be a huge thing yeah i mean the, the whole idea of like 
finding a way to like do science better <laughs> is, a, is, a, is an amazing area of, of work. I mean, yeah. I think some people probably feel threatened by it, but mm -hmm. I think if you kind of, once you learn more about these tools, I think you learn like, like it can enhance what you currently do, you know, like you, yeah. you can like take what it gives you and then build on it and go from there, you know, like, yeah. um, I remember I had a class once where they went over kind of the, the, the march of like technological innovation over time. And at every stage, mm -hmm. there's like people who are like, you know, writing will make everyone not, you know, ruin everyone's memory. They don't have to, <laughs> you know, right. Like, and like, it's just like at every point you have the same exact kind of concerns, right? And like, I think yes. AI is, you know, deep learning is super powerful, but, um, and, I, and I think there will be an economic shift and, and there is, already is, you know, with automation mm -hmm. and things like mm -hmm. that, but um, that we have to figure out, but like, um, yeah, but I think for some people though, um, you know, you're, it just, it just like opens up different work, I guess, you know, and yeah, 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 yeah. Cause also, yeah, we, we also couldn't predict in the sense, you know, what new fields might come from this, right? Um, and new applications and new uh, methods, like for example, like uh, for this, like automatic scoring of behavior. So behavior, like some of it is already semi-automated as, as you might imagine, right? Like mice models, I mean, there's only so many behaviors you could measure in that type of animal. And it's pretty standard, right? But for example, I had a, a friend who was working on, it was like inattention in, in mice and trying to uh, quantify that. And just the training period. So to get the mice to learn, right? How to properly poke their nose into when the lights, and then you had to like dim the lights, you know, at certain intervals. That took months. And it, it's like, she was, you know, working with the mice most of would say so she'd leave in the morning and then come some back sometime in the afternoon for months and I'm like if you can automate this then you can be working on something else right while the system is just tracking it for you and yeah. also like you can get a lot richer sort of data sets right if you for example study not just you know when you take the animals out and then put them in an apparatus because that's very artificial but if you can study them in their home cage, there's so much more that's going on, right? Like social behaviors and hierarchies and all of these things that you can now sort of have access to with uh, yeah. the computational power and all of, all of these you know, like, like neural network learnings or, or whatnot. That is just gonna make it easier and more time efficient. Plus it could discover new like behavioral structures that mm -hmm. one might have missed. So yeah, yeah I, also, I, I really like the fact that for example, like that deep lab cut and then that sleep, it's they're making it, you know, like super, super user friendly and like try to make it like, you know, industry level, like rigor. So it's not just like something that then you gotta spend a lot of time uh, putting together and having it work, you know, seamlessly. And uh, it's all free, you know, you can just go like the, the authors are very helpful in um, trying to provide, you know, help and like resources and also teaching at workshops. And I think the whole point was also, yeah, like you're saying to democratize like this machine learning specifically for these types of tasks. So making it easier for users, for scientists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that that kind of wins out, you know, I guess like, you know, a lot of the time with you know, open source and um, mm -hmm. like it just builds on itself. Everyone's able to contribute and improve on it. And um, yeah, like, I think that's, uh, it's pretty powerful when, when you have a critical threshold of people who are contributing to it, you know? Yeah, 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 I, I agree. As opposed to, you know, I mean, I understand, you know, that that's why you found companies so that you can also profit, you know, from the, the research yeah. that and the money that you're putting in. But yes, then it sometimes brings up, you know, those sorts of like ethical questions, like who owns, you know, the architecture of a network or a pre-trained network. Um, and also, you know, like, like the data, right? Because this, this data is sometimes being collected off of users um, that have no say as to whether that, I mean, that data is yours because it's about you, but doesn't belong to you somehow. You know what I mean? Um, 
-hmm. Like, for example, like uh, there's also efforts on, um, this is really interesting. It's called digital phenotyping. And this is also in an effort to make um, more like quantitative biomarkers of behavior. So for example, from mouse clicks and I mean, obviously search histories, right? Now you can sort of determine, you know, like progression of either neurological disease sometimes, or even like psychiatric conditions. And this is just from like, you know, how you click, maybe how your mouse is moving, like the type of searches that you're doing. And so um, this is available, right? And it's data that would be, you would imagine belongs to the individual person, but it really doesn't, you know what I mean? And um, I guess how it's, it's gonna be used is, is gonna be the interesting thing. Mm -hmm. And privacy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, um, the whole like, um, I think you mentioned something about like animal identification. Um, <laughs> anyway, it reminded me of another project I had thought of a while ago, which was like using a Raspberry Pi, um, like, uh, oh like, right, right. Like a camera addition, like add-on, um, using it as like a nighttime, like like a, a backdoor outside backyard camera to mm -hmm. like identify when you know there's like a critter or something running through right. and, and recording for that period and um, like sending you messages for that kind of thing. That's something I still want to do. I mean, now I, now I talk through it, I'm like, oh, I do have some ideas for projects, but uh, yeah. yeah. Jake's in fact, fine. if you want a very detailed analysis of the behavior of the animal, just use either that sleep or the deep lab cut. And then yeah. you're going to know much more about that raccoon than you ever wanted to know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Awesome. Well, I don't want to keep you, Kevin. I always feel like, you know, I'm just like chatting, chatting, chatting. Um, I yeah. think I've become one of those people that just chat <laughs> on a number of things for a long time but um yeah, i know you're busy I, with class i like it too so um okay awesome yeah i do have to i do have to head out so yeah it was right. great chatting uh thanks again <laughs> i'll talk to you next week yeah right see you next week all right bye, bye.